They were Mariupol's last defenders, a heroic symbol of Ukrainian resistance. Now, they're prisoners of war, and their fate is in Vladimir Putin's hands. More than 260 Ukrainian fighters have surrendered and evacuated Mariupol's steel plant following a bloody, desperate, months-long siege. Ukraine negotiated a deal with Russia and ordered the fighters to give up. That was yesterday. Reuters reports Russia is loading them into buses and bringing them to this former penal colony in a nearby Russian-controlled town. It is unclear what Vladimir Putin is planning to do with the fighters. Russian investigators say they're going to interrogate them about their potential involvement in crimes against humanity. And a Russian negotiator involved in peace talks now says Moscow should consider the death penalty. He says some of the fighters do not deserve to live. Michael O'Hanlon, now senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. Man, can, can Putin use these fighters as leverage over Ukraine? And, and why would Ukraine trust anything they say? Hi, Shepard. Well, I'm a little bit more hopeful on this one getting worked out for the simple reason that Ukraine has lots of Russian prisoners. And there is a natural swapping process that can occur in these kind of conflicts. And to my understanding, has been happening in this one. So while I share the anxieties uh, and the uncertainties of not knowing exactly what's next, and certainly the Russian prosecutor uh, gives plenty of reason for concern, I still feel like, on balance, it was better that they surrender and better that they trust their fate in not so much in Putin's generosity or, or, or grace, but rather in his own self-interest in getting some Russian soldiers liberated. You know, Finland and Sweden set to apply for NATO membership tomorrow. Massive blow to Putin, but Turkey threatening to block them from joining. How do you see that playing out? You know, it's regrettable, and Turkey does feel like the Nordic countries have been too hospitable towards Kurdish separatists. And Turkey has been very, very hard-nosed on that issue for a long time. In the end, I'm still hopeful that we can work a way out of this. Turkey may need some time simply to complain. Uh, there also could be a different kind of a security organization created that doesn't even involve Turkey, but that involves the United States, Great Britain, and the Nordic countries. I mean, I'm not proposing that tonight. I think we should play this thing out and see if we can persuade Erdogan to agree to something that the vast preponderance of NATO wants. But there are other ways to help the Nordic countries get some added security and some alternative treaty arrangements one could consider if it really came down to that. But I still think, in the end, Erdogan, who, you know, for all of his own autocratic tendencies, has done some good things helping uh, Syrian refugees, has attempted, at least, to support a peace process between Russia and Ukraine a few weeks ago. I still am hopeful that we can persuade him uh, to this new idea. Michael, the Putin critic Gary Kasparov had an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal today in which he said some in the West hadn't learned what he calls the eternal lessons of appeasement. He said Putin is a Russian problem and must be removed by the Russians, but the West needs to stop helping him. Every phone call that legitimizes his authority, every cubic meter of gas and every barrel of oil imported from Russia is a lifeline to a dictatorship that's shaking for the first time. Right approach? Well, I half agree, but half don't. I mean, any time we've based our policy on hoping that a foreign leader will be overthrown by his own people, we've usually been disappointed. Think back to Saddam Hussein. Think to the Kim family in Korea. There have been many examples where we somehow thought that the regime was fragile or vulnerable, and then we just waited and hoped and applied some more pressure, and 5, 10, 20 years later, we often saw them still in power. On the other hand, the idea of trying to continue to reduce Russia's earnings from oil and gas exports, that's a pretty good idea. And I think trying to use that leverage to ultimately get Russia to the peace table and then try to say, we will continue to restrict imports of your oil and gas unless you agree to a reasonable deal and accelerate that dynamic. That makes sense. Mm. Michael O'Hanlon, good to see you. Thank you.